Okay. Recording is going. Two o'clock. Welcome back to your favorite class. Yes. We're back, baby. Year 2021. All right. It's got to be better than the last, or so we hope. Fingers crossed. All right. Um, right. Today we have a new topic, which is exciting. Uh, moving on, moving forward with our education. So that's cool. We'll begin on force couple systems today. So there's a uh, notes posted on that. If you'd like to follow along, they're on Canvas. Go ahead and take a look at that if, if that's your style of learning. Uh, a couple of course announcements. Exam number one obviously is the last thing that I sort of saw you do before break. Watched you frivolously scribbling on your papers through the screen uh, that Friday before break. Uh, generally pretty good job. Um, I'd say the average was I think like low B. So pretty good job from, from most. So good job. Um, Grades are posted. If you didn't get a grade or you didn't get an email back from me about why you got a particular grade, um, please let me know and we'll reconcile. All right. The solution is also available if you want to take a look. Full solution um, is there. I'll have a homework probably posted tomorrow morning or maybe tomorrow afternoon on Forest Couple Systems, which is what we're going to start today. And that'll be due next Wednesday. Uh, I took this picture while I was traveling on my holiday. Um, this fine gentleman, I was actually in Ohio when I took this picture. And this fine gentleman representing the state of Wisconsin well, uh, not re using spatial reasoning very well. Uh, so <laughs> he's on the wrong side of the, you know, the pump with his gas pump. And instead of like turning his car around, he decides to try and like get the gas pump to the other side of the car. And what's even worse is he couldn't quite reach it. So his wife got in the driver's seat and put it into reverse while the gas pump was in there. Like, oh my gosh, that's scary. Anyone that's like ever filled up gas before knows you don't pump car gas in your car while the car's running. Like, oh my God. So uh, very suspicious behavior. Um, thankfully, no one was injured. Okay. So spatial reasoning, not for everybody, but you all can do it. Don't be like this guy. <laughs> all right. So let's uh, move onwards then and let's go to a new topic. OK, so hopefully we can all sort of see the writing pad now and we'll move on with the new material. And the new material today is going to be on force couple systems. And before we sort of dive in on force couple systems, we do have to talk about some um, more concepts before we get into that. And really, the first thing that we need to discuss is rigid bodies. So a little uh, sidebar before we get into force couple systems, and that is rigid bodies. OK, so up to now and all the previous work that we've done so far, we've sort of modeled everything that we've had in this class as a particle. So, you know, you have a bunch of wires coming together at a particular point. That particular point we modeled as a particle and we looked at all the forces that were kind of coming off of that particular point, modeled a free body diagram with those forces and kind of drew some conclusions about what's happening or the tensions in the various wires uh, in the certain situations. OK. That's all like particle statics, where you have one particular point of interest, you model it as a particle and away you go. But in reality, most objects cannot be modeled as particles. You have to model the chair as a chair with forces you know, acting on various points of the chair um, that is somehow uh, leading you to some engineering analysis. Uh, the desk is a large object, whatever. Your car has multiple points where it touches the ground. It's difficult to just model it as a single particle. So up to now, we've sort of modeled everything as a particle, and we're going to change that now and start modeling things now as rigid bodies. So I'll make the, that note here. So up to now, we modeled all as particles. Okay. And in actuality, Objects have size and have forces acting on all different parts of them, which we now have to consider. OK. So this is going to lead us to our definition or our introduction of a rigid body. Which is uh, a body that has some volume that does not deform under the application of load. So let's get a definition here.
So here's your definition of a rigid body. It's a body that does not deform under the application of load and has some volume. All right. So it does not deform under application of load and it has volume, right? And realistically, when we apply load to objects, to things, they do deform. Think about like if you just pressed your finger into your skin, you're applying a load onto your body and your skin and your body is deforming under that load. So reality, there is no such thing as a purely rigid body because when we apply loads to things, they do deform, even if it is just a general small amount. So we're going to sort of model things with this general assumption that there's no deformation, but you have to know that in reality, a true rigid body which does not deform under load is impossible to actually have. Ooh. Someone cut him off mute there, watching football. <laughs> Kanan, turn off your football. It's time for the statics. <laughs> Okay. All right. So in reality, objects deform under load. All right. In this class, we will assume that there is no deformation when we apply load. You will talk more about deformable bodies when you get to ME 2004 and 3005. These are your mechanics and materials classes. That's when you're going to learn all about elasticity, how much things deform, how we measure that, all those sorts of things. But for now, before we get there, we have to take baby steps and just maybe assume that we have bodies that just do not deform at all under load. And it'll become apparent in short order why we have to make that assumption. All right. So a lot of engineering bodies that we use are stiff enough where we can make that assumption and it's valid. So think of your traditional engineering materials, woods, steel, aluminum, carbon fiber reinforced polymers, etc. These are all good examples of rigid bodies. Bad examples of rigid bodies might be like your skin, jello, um, some foams, etc. So you get the general idea is it's all sort of relative. I mean, if you apply a if you drop a piece of sugar on a big blob of jello, it's going to look to that piece of sugar like a rigid body. But you get the general idea is that um, in this class, we'll be focusing on rigid bodies. And you kind of have to make it a, a general assumption in this class whether or not a body is going to be rigid. OK, so um, let's move forward then. When we have objects that have volume, we now have to discuss differences between internal and external forces. That's because objects, when they have size now, they could have some internal forces that are acting inside of themselves. All right. One of the internal forces that we're mostly going to talk about in this particular class is the internal force of attraction between all the molecules that exist inside of a body, also known as a gravitational force, right? So every molecule that exists inside of your body is attracted to other molecules through the gravitational constant. Um, but we generally would say that that is the weight of that body. You know, that is an internal force that is particularly acting. The weight of my body on this chair below me is you know modeled as an internal force. I have some weight that is sort of like internal to my person, and we sort of model that as an internal force. All right, so let's make that very clear here. 
So bodies with volume. May be acted upon. By internal. And external forces. OK. So if we want to give a hard definition to these. External force. This is a force that is exerted by one body upon another. All right, I'm sitting on this chair. My butt is exerting a force on the chair, and the chair is exerting a force on my butt. Equal and opposite forces, generally because I'm static, right? It's Newton's uh, third law for you in action. That would be an external force. That chair is sort of acting upon me uh, in sort of this external force. All right, so that would be an example there. An internal force. is forces that are acting inside of an object or forces that are holding that object together. All right, so forces. Holding an object together. And there are other types of internal forces, but those are kind of the ones that we're going to mainly focus on. And I will make the note here that generally the weight of an object would be considered an internal force. All right. So now we're ready probably at this point to start discussing how forces interact with rigid bodies. Now, up to this point, we've really focused our attention on particles and looking at a space diagram of a particle and then making a free body diagram of that particular space diagram. Think about like the cables that were hoisting up that car, that example that we sort of did at the very onset of talking about free body diagrams. Now we have to talk about objects that have some volume and how we might want to model forces that are acting on objects which have volume. Okay, so now we'll talk about free body diagrams. Of rigid bodies. All right, when we only had particles, we really only had external forces. Maybe we'd have some weight of a particle if we're considering like the earth as a particle and it has some mass associated with it as it moves around the sun in orbit okay fine um, but really when we're thinking about free body diagrams of rigid bodies not only is the amount of force that's acting on this thing important but also the location where that force acts is important so for rigid bodies Um, magnitudes directions and locations of forces acting on body are important. Now let's look at an example here. All right, we'll look at a space diagram of a truck being pulled by um, some guys. Okay, so let's look at a space diagram. We'll call this an example. Space diagram of truck. Okay, and this is a, a picture from your notes. Um, I'm not going to try to draw this. 
I guess you can try the best you can if you'd like. But here is a space diagram of a couple guys uh, pulling on a truck. All right, if you wanted to try to sketch this, maybe I'll sketch it because I know maybe some of you are like like to try to do it in your notes. And you can all laugh at my sketch, it'll be fun. Um, something like this. And you got this truck here. Okay, beep, beep. All right, here's my truck. And it's being pulled by some, some dudes here. And this wire is like being held by all these particular guys. All right, this is the sort of a space diagram of what's happening. And I want to convert this now to a free body diagram, which is something that we've done before, converting the space diagram to the free body diagram. And to do this, I need to isolate my body of interest. So just like we did with particles, we're going to isolate this particular object by cutting away everything that is associated with our body and what it touches. So I'm going to isolate this truck. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to sort of make an outline around this particular truck. And every single time that I remove a body that happens to be touching that truck, I need to account for the force that was associated with removing that other body. So if I were to sort of like make a sketch around this particular guy and try to isolate it, I would notice that I have to like cut through the ground here where the wheel is touching the ground. So I'll come back to that in just a second. And I notice that I have to like cut through the ground here where the wheel is touching that particular portion of the ground. And if I continue my isolation, I have to cut through this particular wire here where these guys are trying to pull this truck. So if I'm isolating this thing and I'm thinking about the external forces that are acting on this particular guy, I've kind of cut through three different things. The, the tow cable and then the two uh, points where the wheels are touching. So now if I want to go to a free body diagram of this, I'm going to think about, and I'll do my best here to, to sort of draw it. All right, beep, beep, there's my truck. And I've cut away the ground here. I've cut away the ground here. So I need to accommodate the forces that were acting there. And I will simply do that by understanding that the ground is providing a vertical force that is stopping the truck from moving through the ground. All right, maybe we call this F1, F2, it's sort of stopping the truck from moving through the ground. All right. I also cut through that rope. And so these guys are trying to pull the front end of this truck. And let's just call this, I don't know, F3. And there we go. These particular forces, we would call our external forces. These guys. They're forces that were using in our free body diagram to represent the isolation of our original body from other bodies that were touching it. Okay. It was the rope, it was the ground, etc. Okay, so we need to represent those appropriately. There are other forces which exist on this truck, which are internal forces that we have not yet drawn in our free body diagram. And you can't forget to incorporate your internal forces in your free body diagram. Specifically, we have not yet drawn in the weight of this object. So here's the weight of this truck. Let's say it's there. And we'll label this as internal. Now, the only internal force we're going to talk about in this class is weight. There are other things which may induce internal forces. Electric fields, magnetic fields are probably the most common. Other things that might introduce internal forces are radiation, microwave radiation, etc. Those could stir up some strange behavior inside of materials, especially if you have ferromagnetic materials or ferrofluids or um, some other material that happens to react to those sorts of um, stimuli, let's say. Okay. 
But for all intents and purposes, weight is the only internal force that we're really going to consider in this particular class until we start cutting through our rigid bodies later in the class. And we'll have to talk about internal forces when we cut through our bodies later. But for now, um, this is uh, how we're going to attack these. So we'll notice here that in this particular example, we had some very easy to identify um, points of contact here, like between the wheels here where these guys are tugging on this particular um, truck. But later as we move through the class, we're going to see more and more complicated what we call reaction forces, forces that occur where we're isolating a body from its surroundings. Think about like a ball and socket joint. It might be complicated to sort of think about what forces we might use to represent what's happening at a ball and socket joint. Or think about like a bearing housing. It might be free to rotate in one way, but you can't move it in a, a different direction. Okay, so there are a variety of different restraints or constrictions that we might put on a material that we would have to represent accurately with our free body diagrams. And we'll talk more and more about those as we go into more advanced free body diagrams throughout the class. But for now, I guess it's just most important that you understand that this object here has some volume and we can represent the location and the magnitude of the forces. To do so accurately, we have to put them on our free body diagram where they're actually acting with the proper magnitude and direction in which they're acting. Not only do we have to account for those external forces, but their internal forces as well that we need to consider. Okay, so with rigid bodies, a little bit more complicated because now we have to account for where the forces are acting, not just what the uh, magnitude and direction is. Okay, so now this brings me to a next very critical topic or idea in statics, and that is the idea of equivalent forces. Oh man, spelling is hard. E A L E N T. Equivalent. Yes, I did it. Equivalent. It's like Austin Power says. Where does the emphasis go? Which syllable? All right. Equivalent forces. And this relies on what's known as the principle of transmissibility, but that idea is not all that critical to remember. Um, but the idea here is that. Conditions of equilibrium on a body, meaning it's staying put to some of the forces equal to zero on a rigid body, can be represented with forces that are acting along a particular path. And you can replace one force with another force as long as that force is acting along the same path. So let's put some words to that. All right. Conditions of equilibrium meaning some of the forces equal to zero of a rigid body. Remember how I talked about vocabulary in the beginning of the class? What does equilibrium mean? Some of the forces equal zero. What is a rigid body? Something with volume that is undeformed with loads applied to it. So again, knowing your vocabulary is important. Conditions of equilibrium of a rigid body remain unchanged. If a force, let's just call it F, acting at a point is replaced <clears throat> by a force, let's call it F prime, with the same magnitude and direction along the same line of action.
Okay, that's a lot of words, but let's um, draw a picture because I think that's easier to understand. All right. So pictorially, what do I mean by that? Well, if we have some rigid body here, let's draw some random potato. All right, I, I like to call this my mechanics potato. And you've got a point on this object. Let's call it point A. And you've got a force that's acting at point A. Let's say it's this general direction here, F. This object, if it's in equilibrium, will stay in equilibrium and is equivalent to a situation where we replace that particular force. Remember, this is my line of action. If I have the same sort of like line of action that's running through here, pretend that it's the same rigid body. I know my sketching skills are not the best. And I have a different point here. And I have a new force here, F prime. If F is equal to F prime. Meaning the magnitude and direction of this first force equal to the magnitude and direction of the second force. And on same line of action. All right. So equilibrium is maintained here. Okay, why is this powerful or why is this useful? Well, it can be useful because it can allow us to freely move forces on our free body diagram from one location to another, as long as they're on the same line of action. And that can be quite powerful when we're looking at, all right, if a bunch of guys are pulling on this side of the truck and other guys are pulling on this side of the truck, well, let's relocate the force here to the force there. And if they perfectly cancel each other out on the line of action, well, that truck isn't going to do anything. It's not going to move. OK, and we actually end up using this idea and this concept a lot for some advanced um, simplification of free body diagrams later in this class. OK, so let me show some uh, some examples of what I mean. OK, so uh, one example might be like that truck example that we just had. OK, remember I had my forces that were acting here and here and the guys that were like pulling the truck and also the weight of the truck. OK, so here's F. I think we call this F3. I think we call this F2. I think we call this F1. If we consider that there is like this line of action that exists that extends infinitely along the direction that is the direction of F3 and also negative direction of F3, this would be equivalent to a model that looked like this. where again, we have these forces that are acting here, F1 and F2. And we have the weight that still acts sort of in the middle here, W. But now instead of drawing the force on the right-hand side, on sort of the front end, we would say that we have an equivalent situation of, let's say, pushing the truck. 
So for all intents and purposes in our analysis, these two things are equal to each other, right? They're on the same like line of action. If we sort of like extended this the entire way and sort of consider this all one line of action. These two things are, for all intents and purposes, equivalent. And for analysis purposes, they're the same. OK, and there might be situations where it's easier to locate the force from the front of the vehicle to the back of the vehicle for analysis. So for whatever reason, it could be helpful for us to do that. And we can do so appropriately here by the principle of transmissibility or this equivalent force idea, right? So regardless, the motion of the truck's going to be the same, whether we apply like this F in the front or we relocate that force to be in the back. Whatever happens with this truck is going to remain the same. OK. So more examples. And why this could potentially be useful for you in your analysis. Um, consider a block. And we'll call it block AB. And here now we're discussing rigid bodies. So we have a block that looks like this. And this block has two points. And those points are points A and B, left side and right side of the block. You might have a situation that exists where you have one force on one side. Call it F1, one force on the other side. F2. This can be replaced with. They're on the same line of action. A model that looks like this. Where F2 and F1 are acting at the same point. This is important when we do something like some of the some of the forces in the X direction, some of the forces in the Y direction. We're not necessarily restricting ourselves to doing that equilibrium analysis right at the particle. We could still do some of the forces in X as long as all those forces are acting on, you know, the same line of action, right? So you might end up with some resultant force here that's tiny, that is like F1 plus F2. Right. These are all like equivalent systems for analysis purposes. All right. Same idea. OK, so there you go. Regardless of how you make your model here, here or here, your outcome and your result and your analysis should all follow the same path. They should all get to the same result. But, you know, if I'm working this, I want to work on this problem. All right. One force, very simple, to easy to understand and analyze. Um, my life would be easier if I could simplify it down to that instead of having to like account for multiple forces all over the place or two separate forces at one location or whatever the case may be. All right. Um, all these things are equivalent as far as analyses go. All right. Now, the next little um, caveat that we have to discuss and we have to talk about with rigid bodies is because they have volume and they have size, they're prone to sort of twisting motion or a rotational motion or torque. And so many of you have probably heard that term torque before. And so I'll sort of frame what I'm going to say here with that idea is that a particular point or a particle, which we've sort of talked about in the past, doesn't have volume. You can't apply a force on one edge of it and see what happens on the other edge. Like there, it's all one piece. It's all one point. There's no volume. There's no space to put force on one side or the other side and or not okay so with the idea of placing forces on different points of the body you might introduce some twisting to this guy because there's nothing sort of resisting it from twisting if you're applying a force on one particular end so i want to frame this sort of with an example all right torques and specifically I'll start to use the big boy term, moments. B 
because in reality, um, not all moments are torques, but all torques are moments. So that's going to kind of blow your mind, but don't worry about that for now. And let's motivate this with an example. Let's consider a lug wrench acting on a lug nut. All right, there's a picture of this in the notes. Um, I stole it from your book. It looks like this. Oh boy. Here. I like the uh, salmon colored sweater that this gentleman is wearing. I need to need to find where I get that. They don't have that at my local Abercrombie. <laughs> I don't shop at Abercrombie. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Anyway, consider a lug wrench acting on a lug nut, something like this. We've all seen or experienced something that looks like this. You've got some series of forces which are acting on your body, which in this case is the lug wrench, and you're inducing some twist or some torque or what we call in big boy language a moment at a particular location because of the sort of forces that you're applying to this particular bar. So let's put some words to that. So we'll hear, say here, forces are applied by hands far from the lug nut but the forces are meant to introduce a twisting force to the lug nut. Um, I'll say forces are meant to introduce I'll say for now a quote twisting force It's not actually a force, but let's just put air quotes on this guy for now. At the lug nut. Okay, you might call this twisting force a torque. But in big boy language, this twisting force is called a moment. Okay, very important term. And one of the more important things that you'll learn about in this class, is the idea of a moment. So if I wanted to sort of draw a free body diagram of, of this particular wrench. So I'll go from the space diagram here now down to like a free body diagram. What is this going to look like? Well, I'm going to sort of isolate this wrench here. So I'm trying to isolate this guy. Well, I'm I'm isolating whatever force is coming from this hand, which looks sort of just like a downward force. OK, this guy doesn't need any isolating. He's good. He's good. OK, and then I've got to cut through this hand here, which looks like it's kind of providing an upward force. All right. And then lastly. I've got to separate what's happening here sort of at the at the lug nut. And there is some resistance if this nut isn't coming loose, to the application of the force that I'm applying to my lug wrench here. That resistive twisting force is the moment. So let's draw that here now. OK, so if I was thinking about my free body diagram, um, this is going to be a very crude picture. Hopefully we all follow. Here's like the uh, the torquing axis of the uh, of the wrench and then here's like the crossbar of the wrench that the person's like applying their forces to okay very very crude free body diagram but sometimes you know you do what you got to do so this is my wrench and i'm isolating things from it 
first thing I'm going to do is draw the forces that are associated with this this guy's hands, like sort of torquing this guy. And it looks like this hand is kind of like pushing downwards and this hand is kind of like pushing upwards. All right. So these like opposing forces on either side of this wrench might look something like this. Got a force sort of pushing upwards here. And on this side, I've got this force kind of pushing downwards here. And what this person is attempting to do is they're attempting to sort of like induce this twist or this torque along this long axis of the wrench. OK, so I'm kind of like dotting in an axis there. And in order for this thing to maintain equilibrium and not be moving, the lug nut has to be resisting the torque that we're putting on it so that this thing isn't moving. So in actuality, the nut is what we're breaking away here and we're isolating the wrench from the nut and the nut is actually applying a torque back to us that we're going to show on our free body diagram is our as our moment. And so going forth, that resistance to that torque is what we're cutting away. And that is our moment here. M. Right. I sort of draw it with this curved arrow, but moments are also often represented by drawing a double arrow along the axis which that moment acts. More on this in just a second but could also be represented in this way. A double arrow along the rotational axis of that particular torque, All right? So here, both of these are ways that we could represent the moment. All right, so let's actually write that down to be crystal clear. So moments, represented on free body diagram by curved arrow. Or straight. Double arrow. Long axis of rotation. All right, this idea in this concept is what we're going to really hammer on in the next three lectures. OK, the idea is the forces that you're applying on this wrench are somehow related to the twisting force that's happening at that lug nut. OK, the moment or the torque that's being applied to that particular nut. There's got to be some relationship between where the forces are applied on that body and how much twisting force or how much moment is applied at your lug nut. And if you just thought about this like intuitively for some time, you would think about, okay, well, if I spread my hands out further, that would apply a larger torque or a larger moment. So that distance in this direction where the forces are applied is gonna somehow be related to the magnitude of that moment. That's something to consider. Also something to consider is just how much force you put on that particular wrench is also going to influence the magnitude of the moment at the location where the lug nut is touching that wrench. So the amount of twisting force or the amount of torque or moment that you induce from forces on an object far away from that application are related to the distance that that force is away from that particular piece of the object, as well as the magnitude of the force that's inducing that torque. All right. So all this to say is there's a relationship between applied forces. So think about the applied forces as like the guy's hands on the wrench and resulting moments or torques or whatever you want to say. OK. That relationship requires some sort of complicated math. 
And that's what we're going to cover the next couple of lectures. Requires discussion of new vector math technique. which is the cross product. Some of you may have seen the cross product in your math class, but I'm guessing you probably didn't utilize it in sort of real life analysis. All right, so uh, that's where I'm going to leave it for today, and we'll dig in and dive in on cross product and how it's used and how it's used to actually analyze moments um, on our rigid bodies. So that's it for today. Um, we'll see you tomorrow.